So with so many Turing machines and rules that we can build from states and symbols, something useful to do is to identify each Turing machine with a number. And it shouldn't be any number. Ideally, it should be a unique one. And no Turing machine should have two numbers or be repeated in any trivial way. That is called an enumeration. An enumeration can deal with an infinite number of objects such as Turing machines, given that the number of, of Turing machines implementing a computer program is finite. The other side of the coin is that of search, because when we are able to enumerate and identify every Turing machine, one can search and explore the whole space in an exhaustive and systematic fashion. The basic idea of an enumeration and of an exhaustive search is to transform a countable set, possibly infinite, into a totally ordered set. That means that we can always know which item is first and which comes before and after. The basic requirement for an enumeration is to devise a strategy to 1. avoid repetition or redundancy and 2. not miss any valid element by, for example, falling into infinite branches. One useful way to see an enumeration, even for non-trivial objects, such as Turing machines, is a graph, and the way we can traverse it. For example, a non-effective enumeration or exhaustive search is what it is known as Depth First Strategy, or DFS, because it would try to go deeper and deeper in a single branch of the tree before exploring other branches. But the so-called bread first search goes a level at a time, hence it would be a good strategy to enum enumerate or count objects. The search is said to be exhaustive because it is guaranteed to go through all the elements and for any given number of elements it will do so in finite time. Many sets are countable, finite sets, the sets of natural numbers, integers, rational numbers, computable numbers, but some others are not, for example, irrational numbers. There exists sets for which no effective enumeration exists, the set of real numbers and therefore non-rational numbers, non-computable numbers, or random numbers. The advantage of an exhaustive search is that the details on the enumeration are irrelevant, one is guaranteed to cover the whole space. The following is an example of an enumeration by length and lexicographical order. Let's say we consider the set of all possible strings containing the letters A and B. One way to see these sets is as follows. We have the set of all strings of increasing length using only A. And then the set of all the strings of increasing length using only B then the set of all strings of increasing length that start with B, followed by A, and so on. The number of sets is infinite, and before exhausting one, it would be impossible to get to the next one. What we can do to make an enumeration is to alternate between these sets as follows. We start with all the strings of length 1 that contain both A and B, then all the strings of length 2 that contain A and B, and so on. In this fashion, we can reach any given string with A's and B's of any length in finite time, traversing all the ones that are of shorter length, unlike the way in which we were visualizing the first sets. To this way of intercalating objects is sometimes called dovetailing in computer science. For any number of countable sets, it is still possible to come up with an enumeration because the sum of countable sets is a countable set. A countable set is one that you can enumerate in the way we have just done. This is another example with mathematical logic of propositional calculus. If we, if we want to enumerate all possible formula with the main Boolean operators, we can start in the same fashion as for the case with the strings listing the sets individually, and then producing a total order of those sets by taking first the formula up to certain size and exhaust it, 
and then take the next formula length and so on. This means that the number of Boolean formula are countable. These kind of enumerations can be sometimes useful. For example, by means of an enumeration and an exhaustive search of pros propositional logic like this one, Stephen Wolfram found the single shortest action system equivalent to Boolean algebra. In other words, the formula that can generate all other formula and all possible truth tables of propositional logic. The result can be found on page 809 of Wolfram's A New Kind of Science. In another project that also led to an interesting application, I took Wolfram's project to the next level and I devised a way to enumerate all the formula of first order logic. Most of mathematics like calculus, analysis, geometry, topology and algebra can be written in this language of the first order logic. I showed that with the use of an automatic theorem prover, the length of the proofs found were distributed in a similar fashion to the distribution of halting times for Turing machines, thus establishing an interesting connection that helps to determine when to stop a mathematical proof when using an automatic theorem prover. A useful enumeration in our course will be that of uh, Wolfram's elementary cellular automata. Remember that a cellular automata is another type of computing machine, just as a Turing machine. The main difference is that a cellular automata runs in parallel, but essentially they are the same. Indeed, cellular automata and Turing machines have exactly the same computational power. And for every Turing machine, you can always write a cellular automata automaton that does exactly the same and the other way around. Meaning that whatever you can compute with one, you can also do it with the other. Similar, similarly to computer languages, meaning that whatever you write in Java, for example, you can also write it in C++. As we had seen before, a one-dimensional cellular automaton runs on a tape just as a Turing machine and then applies a global rule that dictates how to update local cells on the tape. Elementary cellular automata are binary one-dimensional cellular automata whose updating function takes the value of th every three cells to update the next one. So starting from the top, we take the rule and update the bottom cell according to the values of three cells at a time. Here are all the possibilities in which three different cells can appear. There are exactly eight cases, which is two to the power of three possible cases. See how for three white cells, the next center cell remains white, but for the case of white, white, black, it applies the rule corresponding to that case and colors the next central cell black. So from all the rule cases, the rule can e either print a one or zero, that is a black or a white in the next central cell which means that we can have 256 possible combinations, that is two binary options to the power of eight, which was the possible number of local rules that take into consideration three cells. Now we can see how elementary cellular automata can be enumerated. We take the eight local rules and then assign, assign all possible combinations of sending three cell values to a new binary value, either black or white. We can then enumerate by the number of in binary represented by the red cells in the rule icons as shown here. So rule 5 will be 5 in binary and so on, representing all 256 cases. So once the space of all elementary cellular automata are properly enumerated, we can conduct an exhaustive search and study the behavior of these computer programs. So we saw some sort of fundamental predictability limit in the halting problem for computer programs, in particular Turing machines. That happens for all type of computer programs. In other words, for computer programs that halt, such as Turing machines, we cannot devise an algorithm to determine when a computer program will halt in advance. And when it does not halt, we can never know, not even running it, because it may keep running forever. But what about other weaker forms of predictability? It turns out that very little can be said about a computer program before running it, and even after running it. Let's see some cases. In the case of elementary cellular automata rules with number 0, 30, 
to 160, 250, and 254 to mention some ex examples, the rules are, are very simple, like this one. Whatever they are fed, they quickly settle into some trivial pattern. Here is another rule starting with some random initial condition. Some other rules show other patterns, such as periodicity and fractality. Some others, however, look random for many purposes. Even starting from the simplest initial condition, such as a black cell, these examples of cellular automata produce statistical randomness, passing very sophisticated tests. Other cellular automata display really complex behavior, including this one with rule 110 that has proven to be Turing universal, meaning that one can reprogram it to behave as any other computer program. Indeed, rule 110 would be capable in principle to run Microsoft Windows or the game of Minecraft. Similar behavior can be found in larger cellular automata, such as these cases. Elementary cellular automata can even display features similar to physical phenomena, such as particle collision. Here is an elementary cellular automaton with rule 219 that annihilates every two particles that touch each other. It reminds me the missile command game in Atari. Some rules are very si sensitive to initial conditions, reproducing chaotic behavior that we will study later in this course. For example, rules 90, 126, and 22 are very sensitive and sometimes behave very orderly and sometimes produce random looking behavior. Even simple questions such as when rule 1 to 6 will produce some sort of guy and tri triangle in its evolution is hard if not impossible to answer. The same richness can be found in many other spaces of simple computer programs like this one in a higher color space. So we need very powerful tools to study the behavior of even the simplest programs and we will use both the knowledge about the behavior of these programs and those tools to study programs to study the world and natural phenomena such as living organisms and molecular processes.